Last time we introduced compact spaces and Lindelof spaces. Today, module 39, let us discuss compact metric spaces. In fact, last time we didn't have any examples. Why? Because now we will have plenty of examples naturally, okay, without uh, without spending any more time. So let us come to compact metric spaces. Earlier, so whatever we have done, we never used the word compactness, right? Now we will bring it and uh, get familiar with the metric spaces themselves. In a metric space, Every compact subset is closed and bounded. You see, I could not use closed and bounded words in an arbitrary topological space, right? As soon as I have metric space, I can use them and suddenly a compact subset is closed and bounded. Let us go through this. Many of these things you must have seen at least for Rn or R and R and so on. But now for any compact metric space, the proof will be similar to almost the same as. So I have to show boundedness as well as closeness, right? Fix a point X naught belonging to X and look at all balls, open balls, Bn of X naught of radius n and center at x0. Every point, every point in x is at a finite distance from x0, right? Because d of xn x0 is some finite number. Therefore, you can always choose n large enough so that that xm whatever x1 you have taken that will be also in the open ball containing x0 uh, centered at x0 and radius n this means that x is contained in the union of all these balls so x is so this is an open cover now okay therefore it is a cover for our subset a also which is compact. That means what? There is a finite subcover for A. So B n1, x1, B n2, x2, sorry, x, x, x naught is fixed. B n1, x naught, B n2, x naught, and so on, right? For some n. What does that mean now? If you take the n away, large enough. La, la, um, bigger than all the n1, n2, nk, okay, that b n x naught will contain all those other balls, smaller balls of smaller radius because all of them are centered at x naught. So a subset is contained inside a ball means it is bounded already. That's why boundedness is there precisely this one. That shows A is bounded, okay. Now we have to show that a complement is open. So take a point z in the complement of a. Okay. For each x inside a, put a put epsilon x is some number I am going to put. What is it? It is d of x comma z by three. Okay. This x naught I can put x equal to x naught. For each x inside a, I am putting d of x comma equal to z by 3. Z d is in the complement, x is variable, sorry, here, yeah, not x naught. Z d is in the complement, that is fixed. For each x, look at the d of xz. That is a positive number. 
because z and x are different. One is in the complement and in the a. So take one third of that. That is your epsilon. X. Now you take epsilon x ball around x. Okay, vary x. What do you get? You get an open cover for a. Right? A is compact, so you get a finite subcover. That will be B epsilon x1, x1, epsilon xk, xk. Union of these finitely many balls will cover A. Now you take the minimum of all these epsilon x1, epsilon xk. There are finitely many positive number. Take the minimum. Okay. Now look at B epsilon z. The z was in the complement. Claim is B epsilon z is contained inside A complement. Okay. To work out this one, all that you have to do is take a pencil and a paper and just plot your points here. One is some A, some other point, and there is some finite cover and so on. Right? You have to do that for understanding this thing. I am not going to do that, that kind of doodling here. Okay, I want to finally get the truth out of this one just by logic, no pictures. Okay, only that way you will learn, you know, your, your learning of point set topology will be strong. So all that you have to do is use triangle inequality to, to show that B epsilon Z is contained inside a complement. In other words, if you take some y, y distance between y and z is less than epsilon, you should show that y cannot be inside A. Cannot be inside A comes to this one, cannot be in one of these balls. Then it cannot be inside A. So at that level, I will leave it to you, you verify that. The importance of compactness stems from the so called Heine Borel theorem, which states that a subset of the Euclidean space is compact if and only if it's closed and bounded. We prove that every compact space inside a metric space is closed and bounded. The converse holds for Euclidean spaces. Okay, so that is the classical result which goes under the name Heine Borel theorem. Okay, so you might have learned it in analysis course, but let us do it here if you haven't learned that. We begin with R. Inside R, we want to say that the closed interval AB is compact. This also you must have learned, but I will redo this one here. So, closed interval is compact, is what I will show. Take an open cover where all these UIs are open subsets of R. Nothing more is assumed. Okay. A, B is a closed interval. These are open subsets of R. Union is, union covers A, B. Union is, you know, contains A, B. Okay. Now I define a subset A of this interval all points inside AB such that the closed interval A to T admits a finite subcover from U. You see, A to T is also covered. So make this hypothesis and then put all those T which satisfy this hypothesis. A to T must be admitting a finite subcover. Put that T inside this A. Okay. Each element in AB is in one of the UIs. In particular, A is inside one of the UIs. Right? Say, let us say A is inside U1. It follows that 
there is some epsilon positive such that a comma a plus epsilon is contained inside u1 by the definition of open subsets in r okay actually a minus epsilon to a plus epsilon will be there but i don't need a minus epsilon part here because i am working in the closed interval ap so this part is contained inside u1 once this is there okay everything up to epsilon satisfies this property therefore this entire you know half open interval is contained inside a in particular a is non empty right right up to a a plus epsilon some some positive part here not just a will be already inside a now put s equal to supremum of a since a is non empty this is a finite number all right least upper bound it has to be inside ab anyway it is enough to show that this supremum belongs to a and it is equal to b <clears throat> understand this statement what i am going to prove ab admits a finite cover if that happens what happens this entire ab will be equal to a all the points will be there b is itself is in a is enough i want to show that this b is in capital a that is the same thing as saying that ab has admits a finite cover okay so what i am trying to say s is inside a and s is equal to b so i am putting i am proving it in two stages finally i want to prove s equal to b right so first i put s is inside a and then s is b so that is the end of the proof all right so let us prove this <clears throat> first of all <clears throat> since i up to a plus epsilon it's already a supremum will have to be bigger than a plus epsilon so s is bigger than a plus epsilon and being the supremum of a of a subset of a to b it will be in a bar okay s is in a bar okay therefore a bar is contained as ab because ab is a closed interval okay it's a closed subset therefore there is some member say u not belonging to u in the same family such that this sc is also inside one of the members that's all i am telling i am calling it as u not i should say okay not u1 see u not i said here okay so s belongs to u not choose zero less than epsilon prime less than s minus a such that s minus epsilon prime comma s plus epsilon prime is contained inside u not so that is again the property just like this one here some open interval around s must be inside u not because u not is an open set and s is inside u not all right nothing very great i have done so far okay once supremum is inside ab ab is covered so i am taking a one of the members here to which it belongs to now you uh, nice observation start by property of the supremum if you take anything smaller than supremum it will be inside the set okay there must be element here okay so it follows that s minus epsilon prime by 2 must be inside a if this is not inside a s cannot could not have been the supremum so this is definitely inside a okay where epsilon prime is some positive number it has been chosen such that this open interval is inside you not so once it is inside a what does it mean there will be u1 u2 uk okay u1 i have chosen for this one i can include that member always because it contains little a here u1 u2 some etc uk i am calling this is a finite subcover 
from this family ui for the set a to s minus epsilon by 2 epsilon prime by 2 that this belongs to a means there is a finite cover like this okay now all that you have to do is put the extra member u not also remember u not covers this portion so this portion overlaps with this one up till here and it goes up to s plus epsilon prime so a comma s plus epsilon prime okay intersection with a b now i can't say this is contained here unless i intersect with a b okay so that is contained inside u and u2 u cap okay you can just put epsilon epsilon prime by 2 also if you want no problem okay if t is the maximum of s plus s plus prime and b there are only two elements this implies that t itself is inside a up to epsilon prime it is there okay if you see these two are both intervals starting from a so intersection i am taking right so minimum of the two will be the intersection okay look at the maximum t is maximum of this one i have taken s plus epsilon prime and a intersection b maybe i should take minimum then t will be inside a definitely okay so this will imply that s is inside a because up to s plus s prime is there okay or it will be up all the way up to b if it is b s, s is more, anyway smaller than it equal to b so in either case s will be inside a so if s is less than b then it must be this number right s plus s prime so s will be always less than t this t t is larger one of it goes above that one that is the whole thing which contradicts s is supremum of a no number bigger than s will be inside a because s is supremum but this shows that up to up till here or up to ab it will be here okay one of them is contained inside this one which just means that uh, there is a number there is a some element which is bigger than s and it's inside that a and that's a contradiction okay therefore s must be equal to b so that completes the proof so the next thing is heinevoll theorem that a subset of rn is compact if and only if it is closed and bounded so this is what we wanted to prove okay so we are going to use the earlier theorem here namely closed intervals are compact then we have also proved yesterday that product of compact set is compact finite product therefore you can take product of finitely many closed intervals take the closed boxes inside rn they are all compact so that is the thing that i am going to use now see now you have lot of compact uh, subsets right suddenly once you have closed and bounded subsets of rn all of them are compact so many examples you have now a subset of rn is compact if and only if it's closed and bounded okay from 3.67 the only part follows once it's compact it must be closed and bounded over now suppose it's just closed and bounded okay that is the way weierstrass started his hypothesis because he was working only inside rn anyway so, so and he called by the way he called these sets limited sets so there are so many different words by different authors and so many you know dozens of people around the same time were working to develop the topology so then there exist delta positive such that a is contained inside 
minus delta to plus delta power n, a large square cube, whatever, any cube you are taking inside Rn. Okay. So this is another way of looking at what is the meaning of bounded set. You can take a ball also centered at origin, but balls are always contained inside the squares and squares are contained inside the ball, larger and larger or smaller and smaller. That is what we have seen the picture, right? So A is contained inside some minus delta plus delta raised to n, right? So it's bounded, that is the minimum. Now A is closed. This is compact. So A is compact. The proof is over. Life was not so easy for people who started uh, these concepts. But now uh, for us, these things look so easy. Thus, we have plenty of examples of compact spaces as well as those which are not. All that you have to take is a non-closed set. All that you have to take is a non-bounded set. Plenty of non-compact spaces and plenty of compact spaces. So we can vary whatever way you like. Everything is in Rn now. Huh? So outside Rn, of course, outside other metric spaces and so on, we have to take. All, all metric spaces this will do. Any non-closed subset of a, a metric space cannot be compact. Any non-bounded thing cannot be compact. Okay. An important consequence of Heine-Borel theorem is that every continuous real function on a compact metric space attains its supremum and infimum. So this is known as Weierstrass theorem. So this, this could have been actually the motivation for, you know, Borel to come up with this uh, thing. Heine was independently working on his own and he had the correct ideas and Borel expanded on them and came up with all this. So we shall prove here slightly more, you know, slightly general result instead of just uh, uh, so let us see what it is. Every continuous function f from x to r on a compact subspace x attains its supremum and infimum. See, Weierstrass theorem was inside Rn and closed and bounded. We don't need that. Now we use the word compact. And then we can go inside any space. You see, I am mixing now metric spaces and general, general spaces. I have told you that. I want to study both of them simultaneously. I don't know any metric now. X is compact. R, R is a metric space. Usual topology. Any continuous function from X to R where X is compact attains its supremum and infimum. To make sense supremum infimum, you have to come to R. In some order topology you have to have. Okay. And of course, least upper bound, greatest lower bound, such things should be there. Okay. So supremum is attained, is the same thing as some people call it a maximum. It's a maximum word is used only after the supremum is attained. Attained means what? It's actually a value. Okay. Supremum is the, the upper bound, least upper bound of all the values. It need not be a value. So here it is attained means it becomes maximum. One of the maximum points. Similarly, infimum, infimum when it is attained, it becomes minimum. Okay. So put S equal to sup of all fx, x belonging to x. R equal to inf of all fx, x belonging to x. The supremum infimum is, is defined for any set of points inside R, including infinity. This may be infinity, this may be plus infinity, this may be minus infinity. That is also allowed here. Okay, since x is compact, fx is compact by Heine Borel theorem, it is bounded. 
right therefore s and r are finite numbers they are the closure points of fx every supremum is a closure point of the corresponding set so this is a part property of real numbers so what is the meaning of supremum okay therefore but fx is also closed because it's a compact thing therefore both s and r are in fx that is precisely the meaning that they are values s is equal to f of some x not it becomes a maximum r equal to fx y so f of some y not so it becomes minimum all right high name or theorem has plenty of applications okay so here is one illustration i can't go on doing everything on a finite dimensional vector space any two norms are similar this was one of the theorem that i promised you that i will prove so now we can prove it remember on rn we had lots and lots of norms l1 norm l2 norm lp norm in general where p is any number bigger than or equal to 1 and then l infinity norm also so we had seen that they are similar but there may be many other norm there are in fact lots and lots of norms this theorem says that on a finite dimensional vector space any two norms are similar okay so they will have all geometric properties similarity by fixing a basis we can see that any finite dimensional vector space over r is linearly isomorphic to rn this is linear algebra therefore the statement of the theorem is equivalent to the following now instead of arbitrary vector space i can just assume we are working in rn any two norms on rn are similar okay so don't worry about arbitrary vector space and so on on rn you can use coordinate or everything you can use now we shall show that any norm i am just just denoting by just no no suffix is here is similar to the l1 norm okay if everything is similar to l1 norm any two of them will be also similar to each other because similarity is an equivalence relation all right so let us prove that this arbitrary norm on rn is similar to the l1 norm we shall show that any norm on rn is similar to l1 norm that is we shall find constant c1 and c2 positive such that c1 times norm x1 is less than norm x is less than c2 times norm x1 for every x in r okay so start with a basis even e to en vector space basis okay for rn now for any x in rn you can write x as a linear combination of these standard basic vectors so let x equal to i raised to 1 to n a i e i put c2 equal to the maximum of the norms of e1 e2 en with respect to the, the the new norm that we are going to estimate okay so there are these n elements are there you take the maximum of them none of them is zero so maximum is some norm, positive number that is going to be our c now norm of x with norm of x i will transmission i ring to 1 to n x is summation ai ai 
norm of that is less than or equal to i range from 1 to n summation modulus of ai times norm of ei each of these norm ei i will replace it by the maximum number c2 here so c2 times summation i range to 1 to n ai modulus of ai that is nothing but the l1 norm of x okay so we get the equation that every every x or the the huge the extra norm the the new norm is always less than equal to this c2 times norm of x1 so one side inequality of what i got okay on the other hand as we have already observed that <coughs> The unit sphere with respect to L1 norm, which we have denoted by S1, that is compact. And this, this inequality already implies that this norm is continuous with respect to the L1 norm. Therefore, we can apply Weierstrass theorem. Okay. So I repeat, because of this equation 24, inequality 24, what we get is that norm from Rn, L1 to R is continuous. Therefore, Weierstrass theorem, whatever we have proved, okay, this norm attains its infimum also on S1. In any case, the norm will never be zero on a non-zero set of vectors, that is S1. So, this infimum will have to be strictly positive. In other words, what we have is norm of x is bigger than equal to some c1 positive for every x in L in this uh, unit sphere with respect to the L1 norm, S1. Therefore, now you take any x not equal to 0 in Rn, you can write norm x equal to you know, you can divide by norm x1, okay, x is not 0, and multiply by norm x1 outside, okay. So, this is a constant, this is norm x1. What I am taking is the, the given norm, norm of x is norm of x divided by norm x1 into norm x1 outside. Now, the inside thing is inside s1, therefore, I can apply this inequality. So that means that this is bigger than or equal to times C1. So this is norm X1 times C1. So combining 24 and 25, we get whatever you wanted, namely 23. So what is the corollary now? There is a corollary here. Any finite dimensional vector space M of any norm in your space N is a closed subspace and complete, actually complete and closed subspace of n. You start with n, which is a nonlinear space. Take a finite dimension subspace m. That will be automatically complete and a closed subspace. Okay. See, finite dimension vector space is not compact. Vector spaces are never compact. But now they become complete and closed. How? The first part follows from the previous theorem combined with the fact that similarity preserves completeness and L2 norm on Rn. Any norm, it is a norm, you restrict it to M. But M is finite dimensional. Therefore, the norm coming from this N is equivalent to, say, let us say L2 norm. But L2 norm on a finite dimensional vector space, what is finite dimension? Some Rn. So it is complete. Right? So its completeness follows because similarity preserves complete. Similarity preserves coziness also. All this we have seen. The second part follows our general principle, namely, if something is complete, then it must be closed in any metric space. 
Okay. Complete means what? You take the closure point. There is a sequence converging to that. But every sequence is a, every sequence converges is a Cauchy sequence. But the Cauchy sequence is uh, is convergent in the subspace itself because subspace is complete. You can't have two different limits of a sequence inside a metric space. You start with a closure point. The closure point may be in the larger space. Right? But there is a sequence converging to that point inside the smaller space. That sequence will be Cauchy sequence. So it is complete means what now? The Cauchy sequence must converge inside the space. So that limit must be inside. So it just means that closure is equal to that n itself. Okay, as m itself. So this is a general, uh, it's a nothing to do with uh, these finite dimensional vector spaces and so on. Finite dimensional vector spaces are similar to Rn, therefore they are complete. That part you needed this theorem. Okay, I never theorem or whatever. All right. So we shall complete, uh, we shall continue a little bit of study of uh, compact metric spaces and then come back again to just compact topological spaces. Okay. Next time. Thank you.